What I was so intrigued by was the evidential nature of Jesus. The fact that he would always come into a city and provide evidence for belief and then preach behind that evidence. So for example, he would say often in the Gospel of John, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, at least believe on the evidence of the miracles I've offered you. Uh -huh. And then for 40 days with the apostles in the book of Acts chapter one, he spends 40 days, it says in Acts one, verses two and three, giving the apostles additional proofs, many convincing, convincing proofs. proofs. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute now, you've just risen from the dead. Okay, how much more do I really need after the resurrection? But apparently he wanted to offer 40 more days of convincing proofs. Then when it's time to select a, re a replacement for Judas, they're in the upper room in cha Acts, Acts chapter, uh, chapter one. And how do they p pick that guy? Well, they say, we need somebody who can testify as an eyewitness who saw everything from the baptism to the resurrection. We're looking for eyewitnesses. And it turns out when they share the gospel throughout the entire book of Acts, they do it in the same way. They say, hey, you know what? The Old Testament predicted this stuff and we saw Jesus rise from the dead with our own eyes. We're here to testify to the resurrection. This, the, 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 the raw evidential nature of Christianity was so powerful. As a matter of fact, as a skeptic, who, uh, you know, we might say to your son, if he's having doubts, you might say, oh, well, you, know, you just need to trust more. You need to pray about it. That's not what Jesus did. When John had doubts, John the Baptist, and he sent his disciples to, John, to, to Jesus, and John's in captivity. And his disciples come and say, hey, John sent us and he wants to know, are you the one? Mm -hmm. I'm sure Jesus at the time might have felt like, oh my gosh, really? Okay, what does he do? He doesn't go and tell the disciples, go back and have John pray about him. He needs to have deeper faith. No, he says, hang on a minute. He does miracles in front of John's disciples and he says, go back and tell John tell what, what you, you saw. saw. So Jesus clearly takes an evidential approach to belief. It's not belief in spite of evidence. It's not belief of, in, in lieu of evidence. It's, it's trust because of the evidence. And this is what he always would say. And this is why you see this pattern of healings and preachings where now my words have merit because you've seen who I am. You've seen what I can do. And that was very powerful for me as somebody who was a skeptic, who was an evidentialist, who wanted to, I could never embrace a view that required me to turn off that part of my mind and it turns out this is the one or what, you know, this is really the uh, theistic worldview that is verifiable or falsifiable based on whether or not this thing happened. Did the resurrection occur? And because it's an event that occurs in a fixed point in time in the past, like all of my cold cases, we can actually apply some of these techniques we use in cold cases to look at the resurrection. I'm wondering if this template for courtroom exam is, is a good place to start our investigation. Yeah, and I think there's a template that we typically use with eyewitnesses in courtrooms that does serve our purposes here. And what we ask are four simple things. Really, we have 14 questions in a jury setting, but there are four things they all boil down to. And they are, look, do we think the person was really even there to begin with? And can they be corroborated in some way? Do we have another witness talking about this or some other evidence at the scene? And, and third, do we, do we have any uh, sense that they've changed their story over time? Have they been accurate and honest repeatedly? Or are they kind of shifty on their story? Mm -hmm. And the, the final thing is, do they have some bias that would cause them to lie to us because they're trying to protect a family member or they're just have a certain uh, prejudice toward our, our suspect or for, uh, or against our suspect. So we have to really kind of look at those four issues. So you applied all of this to the case for the resurrection. Of yeah, Jesus I basically Christ. looked and said, hey, we've got eyewitnesses who said this happened. Do they, if we measured them in this four, these four ways, would they survive that kind of measurement, that kind of examination? And how well would they survive it? And as I went through this process of just looking at those four areas, you really, you have to deal with the fact that these witnesses do qualify. They do pass the litmus test, especially considering the antiquity of their testimony. I can't imagine another ancient testimony passing the test the way these, these gospel authors do. I think if you wanted to end this in the first um, season, in the first generation of, of witnesses, you could have done it one of two ways. Get the body of Jesus. Let's show everybody he's not risen again. So the empty tomb, I think, is in some ways rather uncontroversial. The second way I think you could do it is to drag those eyewitnesses out and have them recant their testimony. Mm -hmm. this, and we don't have any of that in the first century either. So I think we have just three or four bare minimal pieces of evidence in the room. Well, then I said, okay, well, in any death scene, you have four possibilities. Well, in this scene, there are a number of possible ways to explain 
those four pieces of evidence, the death and crucifixion of, of de crucifixion and death of Jesus, the empty tomb, transformation yes. of witnesses, those are the bare minimals. Then how do I explain those? As an atheist, I would have offered a number of alternative explanations. I would have said, they're lying, oh, yep. they're, they were confused. They stole the body. They, yeah, they, they, were, uh, they had delusions, they were they had been fooled by an imposter, they, you know, he didn't really die on the cross. There are a number of ways to explain those four or five minimal pieces of evidence. And of course, one of the explanations is the Christian one. He actually just rose from the dead. Yeah. So I would look at all of those explanations the same way I do in a death scene and ask myself which best fits and explains the evidence in the room. Now, every explanation has a liability. Mm -hmm. And every set of explanations, every case I've ever worked that we won and a jury decided in three hours he was guilty, even in those, there were liabilities on our case. The jurors That's just not reasonable doubt. No, it's those are different. possible doubts. Okay. Different than reasonable doubts. Mm. And so we always all of us have possible doubts. And even even there are sometimes when you have like ten things that point to a same conclusion and there's one outlying thing. And that's your that's your case's liability. And you have to hope that people are able to see that these ten things really cannot be thought of any other way, and the outlier is just, we're never going to have an answer for that. So you outweigh the, 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 the pros. Right. The <laughs> pros and cons the, of every case. And every case has got pros and cons. So I would have said, now as I looked through those in this booklet, all the alternative explanations that are offered by me as an atheist 17 years ago, they all have a numerous really critical liabilities that really don't get the job done. But the Christian explanation also has a liability. And the liability from our perspective as Christians is that we are offering a supernatural explanation. And if you're a philosophical naturalist, somebody who rejects the existence of a supernatural God, well, that's a liability you're not willing to cross. That's a liability that's a deal killer for you. Now, and you it make was it for clear, me, too. If we're going to be detectives... Uh, if we're really going to take on the case, we have to lay down our presuppositions. That's right. Including there is no supernatural. That's right. So if we're saying, hey, I'm out today to investigate whether or not something supernatural occurred, the resurrection. I cannot begin by saying, well, but, but keep in mind, nothing supernatural ever occurs. If you do that, you, you've already kind of got your conclusion in hand before you go anywhere. And as a detective, I, that's happened to me before, where I thought I had a certain kind of crime scene. And I made that choice up front and wasted a week, two weeks, three weeks chasing a suspect who didn't exist because I was so determined to make this crime scene fit in my presupposition. So I would say here, if we're going to be honest and fair in examining the resurrection, we cannot begin with a presupposition against supernaturalism. And if you don't do that, it turns out that our explanation is by far the most reasonable and has the least number of liabilities.